All right, and say hello to everybody out there. So, um, good morning. Good morning. That is a good song um, for those out there. We just uh, sang Good, Good Father. And uh, some of the lyrics, just uh, to recap, it says, uh, and you tell me that you are pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good father, a good, good father. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways to us as you call us deeper into love, love, love. Amen. So let's start by saying God is good. God is good. And all the time. That's right. And that's our message today. God is good. But do you believe that? Do you really believe it? Or is it just something you tell yourself once in a while? Is God good all the time? Is God good when you fracture your vertebrae? Is God good when you find out you have cancer? Is God good when you find out your cancer is stage four? Is God good when your loved one tragically dies in a car accident or some other horrific event? Is God good when your daughter is raped? I mean, these are real questions. And, um, and I know it just made everything really somber, but this is, this is life. And we need to talk life in here. And we need to address it. Is God good when a hurricane, a tornado, some catastrophic, um, as we like to call it, act of God event, destroys a region? We talked about evacuations of the fires this morning as we were praising God for delivering loved ones. There are regions in this country that have been devastated by a hurricane. There are regions in the world that are devastated by political upheaval. And in all of that, sometimes people will doubt whether or not God is good. So I will tell you that as a chaplain for the county, I'm often called out to bad events, horrible events. Um, I don't think any chaplain has ever been called out to bear witness to the birth of puppies. Usually it's something horrible has happened and you're walking into a scene where you're either sharing news that will cause people to grieve hysterically or you show up and they are grieving hysterically and the first responders are like, please. Um, and so in those situations, it's, it's really hard. You know, what do you say to the person who, you know, lost somebody unexpectedly on their drive home like they've done every day for years? What do you say to the young couple that wake up and find their child cold? I've been there and it's hard. And it's hard when people ask the question, why does God let bad things happen to good people? I'm sure we've all heard that before. What do you say? In that moment, when I have my chaplain hat on, um, the focus really is to get them through the moment, to help them endure. And so I will say stuff like, God loves you. It's not his will that this happened. And we try to comfort them. But, <clears throat> If I'm being honest, and we should be, in the back of my mind when I hear that question, why does God let bad things happen to good people? In the back of my mind, I hear myself saying, show me a good person. Who is this good person we're speaking about? By whose definition are they good? So the world will tell you, most people in the world will tell you as, as you ask them, are you going to heaven? They say, I'm a good person. I do more good things than bad things, right? God surely will have mercy on me. But by whose measuring stick are you using to determine what is good? Your own? By my definition, everything I do is good. You're the one that's messing up. You know, you're the one that doesn't understand the awesomeness of my choices. And so the world will say, I do good, fantastic. By your standards, you do good. 
by your standards, you're holy because you are your own God. By your standards, you don't need a savior. When we make ourselves out to be the standard bearer of what is good. So before we get into this, um, I wanted to look up a definition of good because I think it's always good to start with definitions. Now keep in mind this is coming from the concise Oxford English Dictionary and therefore it's kind of the world's definition. But the definition is to be desired or approved of, pleasing, having the required qualities of a high standard, morally right and virtuous, enjoyable and satisfying. That means pie is good, according to the world. <laughs> thorough. I guess I could have left the thorough out after the pie comment. Um, but this is the definition the world gives for good. But perhaps it's time for us to turn to a more biblical definition of good. And so the first scripture I wanted to cover today is in James. Um, and I think we have a slide for that, perhaps. Anyway, uh, James 1.16 starts off with, do not, be be do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Good gifts and every perfect gift is from above. Oh, that's interesting. Um, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be in uh, be a kind of first fruit for his creation. So apparently we're having technical difficulties. So I will uh, insert a little bit of extra time for you to turn to your Bibles if you choose to follow along. Um, and there should be Bibles in the pew backs now. So that's fantastic. So here we read that um, everything good, everything perfect is from above. So when we decide what is good, it's really irrelevant. The important question is, what is good in God's sight? What is his standard for good? And here we say that if it comes from God, it is good. And so, you know, even in the one songs, uh, the songs we're singing, the whole point of us in our walk with Christ is to grow closer to him, to be more like him, so that our behavior becomes gooder. -er. I've been wanting to use that word, so. Um, so in Luke 18, we further read, a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus answered this, he said to, uh, to be born, uh, oh, my notes are out of order, oh no. There we go, it's like the other. Um, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, uh, one thing you still lack, Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. So I threw the extra part in there because money is a powerful distraction from doing good. And here, Jesus further says, why do you call me good? Because only God is good. And the man, whether he knew it or not, was dead on because he was addressing God in the flesh. And so it was true that he alone was good. So when we say God is good, I think it's more appropriate for us to say God alone is good. There's a distinction there that, you know, it, it separates the world's idea of what is good from what God has deemed to be good which is everything of him and from him and through him. So I want to jump a little bit off topic and uh, I want to read through the Beatitudes. We've been going through, Carrie's been going through the different seasons and this here is 
a whole sermon series, but I just want to touch on it briefly and just read through them and say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all, unkind, all, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The reason I wanted to just touch on that a little bit is um, there's two different ways, I believe, of looking at this. I believe there is the natural way, which is perhaps the worldly way or um, the perhaps slightly less authentic way of looking through this. And we read this as kind of a checkoff list and say, uh, blessed are poor in spirit. So if I can somehow get myself to be poorer in spirit, I'm going to be blessed with the kingdom of heaven. I mean, is that how other people have kind of read through this? You know, if I can just mourn enough, you know, then, then I will be blessed and I'll be comforted. So I just need to, you know, get my mourning on. Um, blessed are the meek. Let me be more meek, Lord, so that I can get this blessing. Does anybody else kind of read it like that sometimes, you know, as a checkoff list of things to do? Okay, maybe it was just me. Um, amen. amen. <laughs> so there's another perspective to read through this. If we take that view and flip it 180, which is normally what happens when we look at things from a natural view and then we, you know, get to glean it from the God perspective, the other side of the coin. I think what this is really saying here, or a way to perceive it is, when you die to sin, when you die to self, when you draw close to God, when God's goodness prevails in your choices, in your actions, in your life, the fruits of that will be that you will be poor in spirit. God will so bless you in becoming Christ-like in your life that you will be mournful because you will be mourning the old you that has been laid on the altar and killed, the old you that you've walked away from. Mourning is the breaking away from and the moving on from. And so as we become Christ-like, we mourn the things that we've left behind. And so we look through this list from this other perspective, and it, it, it should inspire us to change, to drop the things of the world that are dragging us down, that are keeping us away from being Christ-like, so that we can produce these fruits in our efforts, in our actions, in our choices. Yeah, all right. <laughs> So, um, so with that new perspective, with the goal and the objective to become Christ-like in all of our actions, with the goal to uh, die to self as we're commanded to do in this journey to uh, salvation as we become uh, fully sanctified, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the more well-known disciples, a uh, disciple we are all familiar with. Um, but perhaps don't talk about enough. Pause for refreshment. So turning to Matthew 26, 20. And I'm reading from the ESV, so if it's off a little bit. All right, I see eyes. Um, oh. Brad was able to do some corrections. If you have younger eyes than me, you can follow along. <clears throat> when it was evening, he reclined at the table 
with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after the other, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes, as it is written for, of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about Judas today. And this last, uh, in this uh, scripture here, and this could be a whole other sermon, it's interesting how the other 11 referred to Jesus as Lord, but Judas referred to him as Rabbi. And it kind of indicated that he may have been distancing or disconnecting or um, you know, preparing his heart, hardening his heart for that moment of betrayal. Uh, so it is said here you know, uh, that he would be the betrayer. Moving on to uh, John 13, 21, please. Say again? All right. So let's contemplate uh, Matthew a little longer. Or I'll just start reading um, because you have your Bibles. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of who he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus, you know, who is he speaking, uh, of whom he was speaking. So that disciple leaned back against Jesus and said to him, Lord, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered him, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then, after he had taken that morsel, Satan answered him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Someone thought, some thought that because Jesus had the money bags, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast. Or that he was giving him something, uh, or he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. I like the emphasis of it was night, because darkness had fallen. Things were in motion. The end was near. And so we don't know a lot about Judas, but there are some things we can infer or conclude. Um, we know that Jesus chose Judas to be a disciple. He was chosen. We know that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him long before Judas even knew it. And he chose him anyway. Uh, we know that Judas, uh, Judas was the treasurer and the bookkeeper of the group, which, you know, we often refer to money as the root of all evil. It's a great tempter. Um, so that may have been an influencer. But here's the thing that we also know. When Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, each and every one at the table, looking around at the other 11, had so much confidence and trust in the other 11 that nobody suspected anybody else. It wasn't like if they did a poll, they would say, you know, that Judas guy. That's the one I'm betting on. These disciples, and I'm reading into this a little bit, but they had so much confidence in the other 11 that they started doubting themselves. You know, it surely couldn't be you. Is it me? Am I going to fail? That's how much trust they had. Judas had been with them, traveling with them. He had been a good and faithful servant. So much that everybody saw him as an equal and didn't doubt him until the end when he fell apart. 
it's an important lesson um, to get sidetracked a little bit. We were talking this morning about some of the mega churches and how their pastors who built up these giant organizations fell horribly. Like, you know, a 747 with no, wing, no wings or engines left, just plummeting to the earth horrifically and destroying lives along the way. These are people, these pastors, that had committed the years of their lives in preparation for ministry, who had built up wonderful tributes and, and worshiped God, but something got to them. You see, and I know I'm off topic and I'll, I'll be conscious of that, but each and every one of us has character flaws. We all have blind spots. We have things that can be used against us. And it's important for us, especially people in leadership and you know, pastors, to be aware and seeking these character flaws, these blind spots, lest they become Judah-like, lest they become like these pastors that are put up on pedestals and turned into idols. They, we all need to be looking for that Judas spot where we can be deceived and turned. And we all have them. And we should all be working on them. There should be something in your life right now that the Lord is working on in you. That is purifying you. And sometimes it hurts. And sometimes it's just rainbows and butterflies. But not always the case. Uh, usually it just hurts, you know. Because... You know, blessed are those that mourn. We have to die in that area, and we have to release it and move on from it. So, Judas betrays. Um, let's see if I get my... <clears throat> so, because nothing is really written about Judas... I don't know, I just kind of speculated, sit there in preparation, your mind kind of just goes through things. And um, I have to imagine that Judas didn't seek out to portray Jesus. I mean, we are all far too selfish to allow somebody to come up to us and say, hey, betray everything you believe in. Our pure selfishness and self-righteousness and you know, wanting to be right would require us to say, no way. So I wonder how this happened. And I, I have to imagine a scenario like this. Um, somebody from the uh, leadership, the Jerusalem leadership, approached Judas. Again, we're just making up stories here. Um, or possible screenwritings for the future. But, you know, somebody approached uh, Judas and said, you know, there are some people in the organization that have a real problem, but I see the value in this ministry. I see you healing, you know, you and Jesus and, and the group healing people, and I believe in you. And all we need to do is set up a meeting where we can talk to Jesus away from the crowd. And perhaps you can help facilitate that. You can be part of this greatness in, in bringing peace. You can be an instrument. And we'll even make a donation to your ministry because we believe in it so much. I mean, I can see this scenario playing out and I can see Judas not saying, I'm gonna betray my Lord, but I believe this is good. I believe this is good for the ministry. Perhaps God doesn't understand this, but I do. And if I do this good thing, it'll bless the ministry. And we have to be cautious about doing that kind of stuff too. Sometimes we read through the scripture and we may not agree with it because the world doesn't agree with it. And we say, but that was then. I know differently. And if we just accepted this kind of sin in the church, we could fill this place up. If we just took the downstairs and turned it into a distillery or a brewery or a marijuana farm, we can take that money and invest it in the Lord's work, right? If we're willing to compromise, wonderful things could happen. 
if we betray the Lord. And so, you know, Judas, Judas got what he got, and we're all aware of it. But I have to believe that he was motivated by what he thought was good, which is the message here. What is good? God alone is good. God alone is holy. Everything that is holy is of God. Everything that is good is of God. Nothing that is not of God is good. You see, it's, it's all the same. And so when we say God alone is good, what we're really saying is that only things that are of God or from God or through God are good. And the stuff that we do, the stuff that we proclaim to be good, is wickedness. And we need to be really careful about the choices we make. Um, I was talking earlier before the sermon, and um, topics like politics come up. And, you know, topics like vaccines and masks and all the spicy things that people like to talk about these days. And um, I find myself in a place where when I feel the most confident when I feel the most assured in my position, when I am the most firm in my boldness, is when I need to be the most cautious. Because I am most likely stepping out in my boldness, in my goodness. And, you know, I compare that to times when I've actually stepped out in faith, you know, like the first time I came up here, and it wasn't me charging forward. It was more like a, you step out and you check the ice and then you creep a little forward. And um, I stepped out in boldness, but I stepped out. I didn't recklessly charge out. I feel like the times I charge out and sprint out and boldly run out the most, I'm probably going in the wrong direction. And then I gotta turn around and make up all that distance to get back where I was in the first place. If I had just done what is good, if I had just done what is God, I wouldn't have charged out in the wrong way in the first place. And so when it comes to things like these hot political topics, you know, as we were talking, it's more importantly to stop and say, you know what, let me reset my opinion and let me contemplate how Jesus feels about this. What's the God perspective? Is it more important for me to be right in this discussion? Or is it more important for me to understand this person, allow them to draw closer to me so that I can witness to them, so that I can minister to them? Is, is this topic more important than their relationship with the Lord? And so, you know, I can do what I think is good which is to win the argument, I mean, because it's satisfying, but is it good in the eyes of God? What is truly good? So God alone is good. Let's try that again. God alone is good. Amen. All the time <laughs> and all the time. God is God. So this... This church, and I would say pretty much every church in the world right now, is going through um, change. Um, we are living in a world of pandemics. Um, we are living in a world of, uh, I'll say, governmental overreach. Um, we are living in a world where people are divided over these topics. And I think it's important for the church, capital C, as they move forward at this point, that they not measure a good service by the head count. I think it's important that the church not measure the effectiveness of the ministry by the monthly balance sheet and how much money came in. Because it's a dangerous thing, as Judas was the money guy, and maybe the lure of more is what incentivized him. 
it's really easy for a church to say, oh, we had more money last month. What did we do different? Let's do more of that. You know, oh, maybe if we started this new program, this new thing, this new shiny something, maybe we can lure people in. But you know what? If you were to have a door prize and somebody got a hundred bucks, I'm sure you'd get more people in. That would work, right? What's the objective? Is the objective to get more people in or is the objective to do the will of God? And so as the church moves forward, be very careful whose goodness you're pursuing. Be very careful what measure you're using for what is good and focus on doing what is God. Let's pray. Father God, we just praise you and thank you. Um, we thank you for the great counselor, the Holy Spirit, the teacher, the one who can reveal in us, convict us of the areas that we need to put on the altar and sacrifice, the things in our lives that we need to mourn, that we can draw closer to you, that we may receive the blessings of meekness and the kingdom of God um, because we are like you. Uh, Father God, we just pray that this message would lead those that hear it into submitting more fully to you. That this would lead to change, it would lead to sanctification, to the further separating from this wicked, fallen world and drawing closer to you. Lord, we do ask for your boldness. We ask for the boldness to reach this, this dying world but we want to do it as you would have us do it, that your will would be done. Father God, convict us when we pursue our will. Convict us when we pursue our goodness. Let all of our actions be pleasing to you. We pray that you would bless this church as it moves forward. We pray that you would bring people in, that they would become part of this family, part of this fellowship, but not at the cost of compromise. Let us be bold in you and you alone, for you truly are a good, good father. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I don't have a um, closing song or anything, so I just want to share a blessing with you and say go forth in boldness and be good according to the Father's will. Amen.